welcoming everyone. Uh, let's rise and we'll read the scriptures together. Uh, this morning we'll be reading from 1 Peter 4, 7 to 11. Let's read it together. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God multiplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Okay, once again, we are continuing our series uh, for this year. The, for the theme of this year, the theme of building up God's house. And we are making steady progress. Uh, the last two weeks, we've already discussed uh, perhaps the two important uh, offices that we see in the church. First, we explored the role of pastors as the shepherds of God's flock. Then we looked at deacons, those who have been selected among us to serve as servants of God, to serve the church of God. And while we can see that each of those positions are important in leading the church and in growing the church, we do know that the congregation should not be uh, uh, neglected as well. And the congregation itself has important responsibilities that uh, they must uh, perform and, and do. So the whole church should work together as the body of Christ. There should not be any parts of the body that we would say are not needed, right? Every part is needed. Every part is important and valuable. And it is when every member works together under God's direction that we will see more clearly God at work in our midst. You know, as a child, I've always been fearful of bees and wasps. I don't really like bugs in general. Uh, but bees and wasps are perhaps one of the more terrifying kinds of bugs for me. Uh, in particular, I hate the idea of being stung. I have a uh, disdain for bugs and uh, fear of needles, and God just happened to put those two things together, right? And so I remember the first time having to deal with a bee when I was in kindergarten. It was my very first experience of um, going outside and having to deal with a bee. We were, it was the first day of school, and just by the parking lot where the buses would come in. Uh, we were waiting for the buses to come, and the, there was a, kind of like some bees just kind of going around the front of the yard. And so the teachers warned us on the first day of school to not be afraid of them, right? They said, don't be scared. Just stay very still if they come close. They won't bother you. They only will sting you if they feel threatened by you. Well, that was very hard for me to do, to stay still. It's very scary, especially when they specifically target you. I don't know if there was just something left in my lunchbox or what, but they just kind of just, you know, started hovering amount around me. Uh, even if I was just standing still, I could feel them buzzing by my ear, hovering over my head. And so I was terrified. It just kept circling me over and over. I wanted to run away. But they told me, stay still. And so I did. And even though it was for like a few minutes, it felt like an eternity. And while I was being stuck in this position of being circled by this annoying bee, in my mind, I was hoping, oh, I hope one day all bees go extinct. So I don't have to worry about them anymore, right? If they were just gone, it would be nice. Eventually, though, I learned that, you know, bees are actually extremely important for the ecosystem for the pollination of plants. So, of course, when I learned that, I had to grudgingly accept that I will have to live with them because they're still good for us. But when you learn about the various ecosystems in our world, it's just fascinating how God just makes everything work together. Every, every creature has its own place and part in the various ecosystems. The disappearance of any single creature can have a huge impact 
on the way everything else lives. When it is in that right balance, everything flourishes as it should. The church should be like an ecosystem that is flourishing, that is thriving, where everyone works together cohesively, right? With one mind, one purpose. It is out of the congregation, the present congregation, that the next generation of the church will spring forth. So we hope that we will do our best as a church to nurture the future. Now we know that God can raise up new leaders, new shepherds, new servants, as he wills. He can raise them up out of anywhere. But it should be our hope and our desire, as indeed will be a blessing to our church if they can come out from our church. May our church be like the fertile soil that will lead to the next abundant harvest of righteousness. So let us prepare, let us make way for the mighty working of God in our midst. As with many things in life, it is better to start small and work our way up. So if we want to be effective as a congregation for God's kingdom, we should begin by understanding our individual responsibilities as members of the congregation. For just as the human body is so interconnected that you, you can see that when there are weaknesses and illnesses in one part of the body, it affects the whole body, right? There's, sometimes it can seemingly un, in a su, seemingly unrelated part of your body be affected by something else that, that's in another part of your body. So too, the church is so interconnected that we can't ignore or neglect any part. Every part is important. Every member is important. And it is important that each member grows spiritually uh, on their own. So we will see as each one grows into maturity, into the fullness of faith, that the whole body will be strengthened. Therefore, let us take care to be persistent and faithful in our own individual uh, Christian walks, in our own walks with Jesus Christ, so that we will not be a hindrance to the overall body of Christ. In the passage that we just read in 1 Peter 4, we see that there are we could, see that, we could say that there are three primary duties that we must acknowledge and carry out. Now, of course, these are not going to be all of the duties, but they are going to be the ones that we will be focusing on for today. You'll find these very familiar, as these three are uh, very important for our faith, and we can constantly talk about them. And so they will be our focus for today, these three duties. To begin with, let us review verse 7. And it says there that, that the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Now, as far back as I can remember, uh, within my family, within my church, there's always been this expectation of the end of all things, that it would eventually come. Now, most civilizations, cultures, societies, religions, nations, all throughout history, uh, perhaps they may have kind of been expecting it, but they didn't really think too much about it. But certainly within this last century, within the developments that we've seen, within all that is going on today, both uh, man-made and natural disasters, we see that the end of all things has become a concern for the world at, at large. But for us as believers, it should be no surprise. Right? It should not catch us unaware. We see even throughout the whole Bible, even starting from the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, that there's this uh, expectation for the end to come. While the Old Testament revealed that it would eventually happen, the New Testament affirmed to us that it is not far off. Even the Apostle Peter in this verse that we just read says the end of all things is at hand. We are nearing the end. The early church was so convinced of it because Jesus Christ himself told his disciples to be ready, to keep watch, because we don't know when he's going to come back, but it will come when we don't expect. And so the church of God throughout the ages has been constantly keeping watch because of these warnings. It's always been in the back of their heads. I imagine that generation after generation, believers continually considered the possibility that the end would be soon, maybe even in their lifetime and that Jesus would return. Now, even though I always had an expectation for it, that the end 
uh, would come any day now. It feels like with, a, with each passing year, it just becomes even more imminent. The possibility is drawing closer. Every year, another sudden unexpected thing happens. That reminds me of something else that the Bible had already talked about long ago. Even this year, even this month, we're, we're starting to see all these unusual happenings um, in the skies above and even on the earth below, everywhere. It's like there are all these unusual things that we normally don't see. God is giving us warnings constantly to keep us on our toes. We must be prepared because he is coming soon. The end of all things is at hand. That is why we must be uh, self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of our prayers. So here's the first key point for today's message. As God's people, we must not wait to get right with God. Right? Don't wait to get right with God. Now is the time. One of the core aspects of our faith is that our faith in Christ Jesus is not so much a religion as the world sees it and categorizes it, um, but rather it is a relationship. Everything that we do as a church, even though it seems religious, but in reality it is in light, it is in view of this relationship, personal relationship that we're supposed to have with God. When we come to church, we don't just come for the sake of doing the, the traditions and the, and the religious aspects of it. Instead, we're here to do it because God commanded us to do it. We're here to worship him. When we spend time in devotion, we're trying to know more about him and his will for our lives. When we pray, we are speaking to him. And when we read the Bible, we meditate on its truth, we are hoping to listen in on the words that he desires to speak to us. We're not looking only outward at the people around us or even inward in self-reflection of our own selves, but we're also looking upwards to the God who sees us, who knows us, and wants a relationship with us. For he is our creator. He is our God. He is our Lord. The, the idea of prayer, it's simple, right? And even those who do not know God can still pray, certainly. Anyone can pray. And that is why whenever something big happens in the world, whenever something terrible happens, someone may simply express their sympathy, regardless of what their faith is. And they'll say that they're offering their thoughts and prayers to people who are hurting. But the Bible teaches us that not all prayers will be helpful. It's a nice sentiment, but not all prayers are effective. That's why the disciples came to Jesus and they asked him, teach us how to pray. And Jesus, upon being asked this, did not tell them that, oh, it's fine, you can just pray however you want. No, instead he gave them guidance through the Lord's Prayer. He says, here is how you pray. Now, we don't have to pray in the very specific way of the Lord's Prayer all the time, as though there's some special formula, but we do have to pray with the right heart and understanding, because we are praying to the God who knows all and sees all. He is the one who judges the intentions of our hearts. The prayer of the righteous person has great power. It is powerful and effective. But likewise, this means that, in a sense, there are prayers that are going to be weak and ineffective if they're not prayed in the right understanding of God's will within the right relationship with God. So for the sake of our prayers, for the sake of your prayers, for the sake of the communication that we're supposed to have with God, we must come before him with the sober mind, with the sincerity, because it is a real relationship that we are having with him. So we must get right with God. Make every effort in your spiritual walk with God, doing what you can to be obedient to his word, starting with the repentant heart. Right? God is loving and will forgive you of every sin, but you have to acknowledge it, that you are sin a sinner, that you are sinning against him. You must confess it before him. You must seek repentance. And because the time is short, we are not to wait for this. We are not to delay, right? We are to do it as soon as we can. We must be ready. As it says in Luke 12, verse 40, you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. 
So you must be ready. Do not wait until tomorrow. Do not wait until even tonight. Sometimes we like to put things off a little bit. Continually examine yourself, your relationship with God, whenever you are able. Are you ready right now? Do you have a relationship with God right now? Is there some doubt in your heart concerning that? When you pray, do you expect that God is indeed listening to you? Do you expect that God will answer you? Do you know that God truly loves you? Do you feel his love for you whenever you read his word or hear his word being spoken? If you have a real relationship with someone, they will not completely ignore you, right? If you think you have a relationship with someone, but they don't answer your phone calls, they block all your messages, they never want to meet up, never want to talk to you, I'm going to say that that's not a real relationship, right? If you're not close to someone, but you still have a relationship, they're not going to completely ignore you. They'll still answer you because it would be rude otherwise. And if you are indeed close, oh, then that's the best kind of relationship, right? They will always be there for you whenever you need it. So we need to have this relationship with God and expect that we know indeed that God is in our lives. We must be ready. It says that Jesus will come in an hour we do not expect. Now we cannot expect when he will come, but we must expect that he will indeed come. We must be ready now. We must make sure that we are in a right relationship with him now. Because only then will you enter into his kingdom when the final hour arrives. So we must be ready because we don't know when it will be. Now let us look at verse uh, 89 in 1 Peter 4. And it says, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling. So the next key point I want us to focus on is this, that as God's people, we are to keep loving one another earnestly. Now, we know that the word love can have many different meanings, and because of that, people can misunderstand the love that we should have. Some people may think of love as simply being nice. But even though love can seem simple, it may not be so clear for everyone to understand the love of God. After all, love is not simply being nice, right? There is a depth of heartfelt intention as well as the desire for the good of others, regardless of how they feel. Now, as children, we may not always understand the love that our parents have for us. I know that parents uh, don't always have it right. They're not perfect. Um, And as a result, they're not all experts on how to do parenting. Sometimes their methods, their decisions, they don't always work out best for every child. But even when parents are not particularly harsh, uh, children may also still feel that they're there's too much discipline, even when there isn't. Without a proper demonstration, though, of love to come alongside the discipline, it will lead to a distorted view of discipline, as though it was just, as though it's just wrong in all respects, as though it's just only painful, right? But if there is a firm communication of love through our actions, then the child will realize, okay, this discipline is not meant to hurt me, but to help me. It is like how some people read the Bible and they just cannot understand, how is this really a book of love? Right? They may think of it as conflicting. In the Old Testament, we see time and time again this issue with the Israelites of how they always turn away from God. They're always following after the idols. And because of that, they had to endure a lot of discipline. They had to go through wars. They had to experience disaster and famine and plagues. And of course, the most uh, painful example of the discipline that they would receive from God is the final one of the Old Testament, the exile of the whole nation. They were defeated by their enemies. They were humiliated, and they were taken away from their homeland, losing literally everything that they've ever had and owned. And it, but it was all in God's plan. It was his discipline because they would not turn to him. They, real, they, they continued to worship idols, not realizing that is something that is even more destructive for them than whatever God was disciplining them for. And when it seemed that they would never get it right, 
right? When the whole world just cannot seem to get it right and turn to God and recognize who he is and his love for them, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, right? To love, to heal, to forgive. And through that sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, we could finally understand just how clearly God indeed loves us. Though he had blessed them time and time again, the blessings alone did not make them realize how much he loved them. Though he had disciplined them out of love, they still struggled to understand this love that he was showing them. But the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is the greatest declaration to all of us. Look how much that God loves us. The God of the universe came down to earth, right, in the form of a baby, chose to be born among livestock in a manger, lived most of his human life really as just a humble carpenter in a small village in the countryside. But then when he started to finally show his love publicly to us, what did he receive? He was arrested, beaten, humiliated, publicly executed in the worst imaginable way for everyone to look at and for many to mock. And he did it all willingly, though he committed no sin. As the most perfect, truly righteous man above all, he is the one who should deserve everything good, but he received that for the purpose of bringing us into that right relationship with him. All for the purpose that we, who are the real sinners, the ones who truly deserve that punishment, who truly deserve that death, we might have eternal life instead. And this is why Peter says that love covers a multitude of sins. Because all the love that we should have for one another, it's not a love that comes just from us. It is a love that comes from God. So Peter says in verse 9 that hospitality should be shown to no one. Uh, should be shown to one another without grumbling. Now, this is an important aspect of love as well. Although it is nice to hear that someone loves us, how much more better is, is it if they show it to us? 1 John three sixteen and to 18 says this, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Now, God's love is shown through his actions. It is in all the blessings that he provides us generously when we ask of him. It is in the discipline he gives when we turn away and lose sight of him. It is in all the opportunities he shows us through the ups and downs of life that we might know him. And it should be most clearly understood in, in Jesus Christ and the way he laid down his life for us. With all the love that he shows us daily and even in the fulfillment of that love on the cross eternally for us, would do we show in our own lives, in the way that we live, this same amazing love to others as we ought? If we close our hearts against God, others, how can we say that God's love truly abides in us. Now, words are nice. It's nice to hear someone say, I love you, but it's not enough. Sentiments are nice, but it's not enough. Without love through action, through deeds, can we truly say that we love as God loves? Now, as fellow believers and servants of God, let us remain steadfast in checking the motives of our hearts. Is the love of God that moves us to, to do good? Is it the love of God that moves us to do good? Is it uh, the love of God that is uh, driving our actions as we live? Even if the people of this world, they misunderstand the meaning of our love through the words that we say and say and teach them of the Bible, let them understand the unmistakable meaning of our love through our actions. Let us go back to 1 Peter 4. And we'll look at verses 10 and 11. And this says, as each re has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So when we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, you should have a gift 
right? God has purposely given it to you as part of his grace. And so this is our last key point for today. As God's people, we should be good stewards of God's grace. Now, if you remember our series on 1 Corinthians, we, we did talk uh, briefly on the gifts of the Spirit. And we, we talked about how not all of them are going to be that obvious. All, not all the gifts of the Spirit uh, are uh, mentioned in the book of 1 Corinthians. Instead, we should understand simply that everything that God gives us uh, to serve the church, to serve others, is the gift of the Spirit. So we tend to look more obvious, uh, to tend to look at the more obvious gifts, right? Such as those who are perhaps uh, called to preach the word of God in the church, uh, or those who are perhaps even called to be missionaries in a distant land. And we may think, okay, so they are the ones who have received this great gift of God. But for us, for the rest of us, maybe it's, we don't have any gifts that we can use. And we are content to just not do much of anything else. But that is not the case. If you are saved by the grace of God, you have the Holy Spirit within you. And if you have the Holy Spirit within you, you have gifts that God intends for you to use. Peter states here that we as disciples of Jesus all have gifts of God. Right? Note how he says it. Right? He does not say those who have received the gift should use it. Instead, he says, as each has received the gift. Right, so there's this uh, implication that we have all received the gift that we, from God that we have to use. So God has given each of us something that we can use to serve the church. There is no exception. Right? If you are indeed in a right relationship with God as you uh, believe, then he has called you to love and to serve. These are not um, recommendations or, or guidelines. These are commands from, from God. These are the duties of every believer, of every member of the congregation. So I implore, implore you not to dismiss your ability to serve God and to serve in the church. Now, some people may simply be unsure of their gifts or um, of a gift if they don't feel like they have that many gifts. Right? You don't have to give up so easily and assume, though, that there is nothing that you can do because you indeed have at least one gift, if not more. Now, there are spiritual gift tests that are available. You may have uh, seen those or heard about those. Um, and those may help you understand what God has put in you. But I don't think it's necessary to rely on such things. What's necessary is that within you, you already have the heart to serve. You want to serve God. You will not give up on it. And if you seek to serve God we know that God will honor that, right? Remember the words of Jesus. He said, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. God will help you understand how you are to serve him, how you're to serve his church. It might be as simple as seeing a need in the church and realizing that, oh, wait, I can meet that need. Or perhaps God has already placed a special burden on your heart and you feel like there's something you want to do, but you're not sure about your talents or skills for it. But if you have that burden in your heart, maybe that's God leading you to in that direction. Or maybe you just have to do whatever you can to serve others. And by beginning to serve in the little ways, you will start to see God open the bigger ways. And God will reveal to you more about your gifts. Regardless, God has given us gifts that we can use to serve one another. And what God has given, we are not to neglect. Because every good and perfect gift comes from the Father. These gifts you have received, whatever they might be, they are good and they should be used for good. Whatever is good, right, we don't want to let that go to waste. And so for our serv for through our service, we see that God is glorified. So let's take these words of God uh, through the Apostle Peter that we just read to heart. As members of God's God's church, we should be certain of our relationship with God, knowing that we can pray to him and that he will answer us. We should be seeking to show God's love through our actions. And we should serve God and serve the church, knowing that he has given us the good gifts 
that he intends for us to use by his grace. And if we all aim to follow these commands, God will bless this church and he will use it for his glory. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much once again for your word. We come here every week uh, and we just look at your word and there's always so much that we can learn from your word, uh, from you directly, Lord. And so I just pray, O oh Lord, that, uh, that each and every one of us, that we would truly seek to be members of the congregation, members of the church that you have given uh, to us. It is for our benefit, O oh Lord, that we truly live out our, our Christian walk, live out our spiritual lives according to the way that you have taught us through your word. So I really pray, O oh Lord, that we would have that firmness, that foundation of a right relationship with you. O oh Lord, we don't do this just as a tradition uh, that has pa been passed down by, uh, by our parents or uh, through our culture. But we do this because we know that you are our God. You are real and, and you desire to have a relationship with us. When we pray to you, O oh Lord, I just pray that we can see clearly the answer to our prayer. Even if it may not be the answer that we're looking for, we know that in all things, you desire to just have this real relationship where we can truly love you, Lord, and know you and be loved by you. May our lives reflect the beauty of our Lord. May our lives truly show the unmistakable love that you have given to us, that we might show it to others, that we might serve others without grumbling, without complaining, without feeling like we're under this compulsion, but that we are doing it because it brings us joy. And so in all things, O oh Lord, we seek your, your many blessings, your spiritual gifts, your great power in our, in our lives, and your working in our lives, O oh Lord. May we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. May we have the joy that comes through faith in Christ Jesus. And may others be able to see just how important it is that we come to faith in you. And I pray all this in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.